Hello there and welcome to another strategy pattern video. Now we're going to have another masterclass in chess strategy. And well, we got to ask ourselves and I've I've got to ask myself, why 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 am I giving this away for free? I mean, why why do we have the most instructive chess content here on YouTube and we have like 2 2 300 people seeing it? I don't know, but we do. So, appreciate it. And you can do that by liking the video. There are links in the description if you want to donate. If you want to share the video maybe on, on, on places like Reddit. Go ahead. Feel free to do it. Share it with your friends. Or maybe, maybe not too many because you, want, you don't want them to get as good as you will. So let's dive right into it. The name of this pattern is the Averbach Wedge. And we name that after Yuri... Averbach. Now Yuri is a Russian, former Soviet Union uh, grandmaster, and he has a variation named after him in the King's Indian, and it goes like this: King's Indian, bishop d7, e4, d6, bishop to e2, uh, postponing the development of this knight <coughs> on g1, and then playing bishop to g5. And if black plays, you know, in a normal kind of King's Indian way, e5, d5, knight c5, white can get a pretty quick attack. And this is one of the uh, like early games where uh, this uh, this pattern was uh, well demonstrated. And Averbach he played uh, pawn to f3, protecting the pawn, h6, visit to e3. Now this is a different pattern that we will, well, will not cover. We, if we take this, knight takes e4, check on h4, pick up she bishop. So the bishop retreats. Different pattern, we'll cover that another time, because it's important for the king's Indian. <clears throat> so white along castles. And the build-up was kind of slow, so we're going to, you know, just go through it, rookie one. Not sure what that is all about. Well, bishop d1, it's all about uh, rerouting the bishop to get the knight out, knight g2, e2. And black probably plays too passively and ends up with, uh, well, tough position after g4, knight g3, and white playing h4. And now we start to see the wedge immersion. The queen e7, h5. And now with this big battery here, the rook on h1, pressure on h6, it looks unbearable for black to allow white to open the h file by playing h takes g6. So he plays g5 to close it down. But this introduces the Averbach wedge, which is these pawns, very strong. Meanwhile, black not as strong. These strong, uh, these strong pawns give us a space advantage, and also we have this square available. And note that this square is not available to a black knight because you can't access these squares. They're taken by the uh, white pawns, so black is not going to establish a knight on f4. And this is very important. So let's see how the game played out. The basis of the, this pattern is that once you establish the Averbach wedge, you have a nice base advantage on the king side. You have this f5 square available. And usually, because you have this d5 pawn, you will have a space advantage on the queen side as well. So, that, yeah, the queen side is where you will push through. So, basically, two. And, and you know, the, the progress is slow here, but. Okay, rook f1, protecting the pawn. He even brings the king over to the king side before doing much. You know, king king d1, king e2, and then he brings the rooks over. It starts to build up. Takes, takes. Rook d1, taking over the a file. Taking on d5. And even, you know, I mean, the way that... You know, white played it, wasn't really perfect. 
he might have been able to play, play better. But this is kind of the stem game, you know, where White got this this wedge, he went through on the king, uh, the, the queen side, and the rest was kind of easy. Eventually, yeah, the pawn came to close to queening, and, and White won this game. Starting to collect material, and it, it's yeah, it's game over here. Rook takes g7, and white's gonna win. Bishop takes queen here, check, trading queens, and we win. So, this was not the first case where we had, uh, you know, this this this, this wedge, but I think it's it's acceptable to call it, uh, name it after Averbach because it's in, uh, the Averbach variation, and, and, and he played it himself. But here's a game uh, where Fritz, uh, Fritz Seamus uh, executes the same idea, and this, this game happened earlier. But it was in, in a different duration, of course, in, in the Seamus variation. So this can arise in many variations uh, of the King's Indian. And we'll show you how it applies to, to, to other things later. Okay, knight c5, bishop back to e2. And just like in the Averbach game, white is pushing h5, and again the pressure is unbearable on the h file and on the diagonal, so black closes it down. And this means that white gets more or less a free hand on the, whoa, I went too far there, on the queen side. So let's get that position back up here. And let's quickly go through it. Uh, so white starts to build up on the queen side. Typical expansion, a3, b3, b4, it's coming at some point, so the rooks come over. Bishop f1, you know, just, you know, preparing stuff. And notice that very often the knight is looming here, it's, it's ready to jump in, especially if uh, the light squared bishop is traded off. So that's an important trade for white to try to uh, accomplish in the Averbach wedge, get rid of the white squared bishop, and then you can jump into f5. So queen e8, then we have a4, b4, knight b3, and this knight stays there for a while, but white kind of just, you know, plays around it. And black doesn't have any breaks, he, he's just waiting. If you play c6, this hangs, you can't move anything here. So black is just waiting, so white builds up. Black even takes this pawn, thinking he can draw, but same as one of a nice game. You know, he, he built up on the c-file, the rooks come over, rook c6, and notice absolutely no counterplay whatsoever for black. Nothing. He's just waiting. And eventually White found, after some shuffling, <coughs> he found a way to uh, take the knight on, on, on b3 while covering the pawn on a3. So rook uh, took on b3, so now we're covering the pawn. And then he maneuvered the rooks behind the pawn, pushes the pawn, and eventually pawn to a5. And Black is just lost, takes takes, a takes b, and if black takes twice here, it's b7 and we queen, so black is losing material. Yeah, he can't take on a3 now because b7, so he has to play with b8, but now b7 anyway, and we win a piece if he takes my rook a8. So a nice win by Seamus, using the Averbach wedge, but probably didn't know, you know, what it's called. Uh, Lev Porgieski. Another great Soviet grandmaster, he played a great game here with uh, the same idea. King's Indian, Averbach variation, bishop b2 and bishop g5, bishop comes back. And very often when, when this happens we win a tempo because queen d2 forces king h7. And then we push h4. And this is kind of, you know, like the pure way to get the Averbach wedge. You know, queen d2, bishop b3, pressure here, and an immediate h4, h5. And black can't do anything. He played g5, and now white is going to set up the Averbach wedge, uh, wedge with uh, g4. Notice also the maneuver here, which is typical for this variation. Before playing f3, white plays knight f3. And this knight, like in previous games, is very happy on g3 to cover f5. And that's exactly what happens in this game. Bishop b7. Now it's two, <coughs> and okay, black, you know, tries to get space on, on the queen side, but white can break, you know, at his will with a3, b4. Let's quickly see how this game progressed. Uh, rooks over to the queen side, because that's where we want to build up. 
b4, f3. One over the knight, it comes to g3. And then we uh, go about dragging through on the queen side. We have this trait, which white likes because of the f5 square, which is now a fantastic outpost for a, for a white knight here. Game continued, and white just, you know, built up here. And I just want to show you a few games, so, you know, get the general idea. I guess I, I guess we'll leave uh, the games uh, in, in a library on chess.com. I'll, I'll give you the links so you, you can play through the games. And I even spot it again, but you know the same thing applies. Now look at this. This knight maneuvers as well. It goes here, here, here. So we can put an iron f5. Actually beautiful uh, strategical stuff. Knight to f5. And now white is uh, building up on the B file. <coughs> and eventually he found the breakthrough with D6. And it's tough for black to take because queen here attacking the bishop, queen here. And surprisingly difficult to defend against this. And this breaks through, takes takes. And white won a very nice game. <clears throat> so the final example before moving on to my games and I want to show you like how this knowledge really helped me in my chess career So first we're gonna look at the game by Bent Larsen against Vlastimil Hort Different variation, but you know the same thing can happen Bishop g5, bishop back, queen d2, king h7, g4 and then eventually h4 and even though black is, well, considerably better on the queen side than in previous examples, it doesn't seem to matter much because we get this h5 in, black has to close it down, and we have a beautiful position. Building up on the queen side, knight c1 to d3, black, you know, tries to hold down to the c5 square, white maneuvers, and usually when you have this kind of position, you, you can maneuver around at will. King g2, typical move, you know. Just getting out of this diagonal, protecting the pawn. There's no rush for white because he has all the strategical trumps. This is g5, takes, takes. And white has a beautiful position on the light squares now. This piece is virtually useless. And now the knight maneuvers to e3 because from there it covers f5, great square, and c4. And Bent was able to win a nice game. He uh, played a3. And we have some maneuvers. a4. And then bishop b5. Beautiful sacrifice to gain complete and full control over the light squares. And now the king is just entering. And this is just beautiful stuff. And in fact, after these moves, uh, black resigned. He's up a pawn, but he's completely lost. We can this, uh, we can win this pawn at will. Take with a knight, come back with a knight here. We can come back with a knight here. Win this pawn. A5 is weak. It's just completely and strategically game over. Beautiful example. So now we get to my games, uh, and I had two games uh, against the same opponent, uh, a Polish player who lived here in Iceland for a while. Rated 2250, and I played him in two important games. One was a rapid game, a team competition, and the other was uh, in a norm tournament, a closed round robin tournament where he tried to get uh, international master norms. And well, maybe actually, yeah, I got an IM norm in, in the tournament where I beat him, so this was actually a very important win in my chess career. So this one was. I think the rabbit game. I had the white pieces. And I had noticed that he liked to play kind of a modern setup, you know, with, with g6 and bishop g7. We have this, knight g3, and he, he you know, he doesn't play knight f6, which would be a king's Indian. He plays h6. You know, he's playing, you know, kind of a mixed system with, uh, it's kind of more like a hippo system, bishop b2, knight e7. But what this allows, uh, 
uh, more so than the King's Intended. It's like more control for white. You know, we have these pawns, beautiful center, and black isn't challenging in the center like in the King's Indian, so you have a lot of time. And in this game, I eventually realized that I'm playing a very good King's Indian. I'll play Queen D2, attacking the pawn. He played King H7, and now I'll play G4. And he simply played it too slow. Maybe he hasn't tried something dubious, but he played Knight BC6, H4. And kind of switched over to a King's Indian here, but it's a really bad King's Indian. Now he has to go back because I have this completely under control. Knight b8. And now I'll play h5. And what do we have? The Averbach wedge. I need to con you know finish it with, with pawn to f3. But okay, first knight h2, covering the pawn. And where is this knight going? You should know it already. Knight f1, of course. Let's go to g3. You play rook f7, play knight g3. I could play f3, but there's no rush. Castled, b4, and eventually f3 because he's, he's hitting my pawn. And now I just built up on the queen side, and black has virtually no counterplay here. Play a5, a3, and I'm just building up. You know, there are many ways to play. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying like there's a clear plan to win or build up on the queen side. It's just what you want to do. And during the game, you just have to find out how do you want to do it. So here, I took on Passant, and I think eventually I found a tactic where, uh, yeah, c5, actually a nice tactic. Because I would use the fact that this guy and this guy will be hanging. He took on c5, I played queen a2, I think he missed that, and this won me the game, this is hanging, and this is hanging. Bishop b6, and I take on a6. I won material, and he crumbled here, and I, I won this game. Important to win uh, in a team competition. But then the next game was even more important for me. Because it was a tournament where I, I got my second Diamond. And it was more of the same. You know, he always played this modern type setup. And, you know, he did quite well with it. But there's a problem. You know, if, if White knows his stuff, it's about four. Very similar to the last game. And to my surprise, he kind of allowed the same thing. I went back with the bishop. Okay, I'm losing a tempo, but, you know, he's losing a lot of time also. I'll play bishop e3 not to be hit with some, you know, knight takes d4 tactic and then e5. Because I want the same structure. He played a6, g4. And again, he went for the king's Indian structure, e5, d5. But he's walking straight into it. h5. Note that if he takes on g4 in this case, I'll take on g6 and this hangs so he has to close it up and then the same maneuver so this like this pattern you know how to close it down like this you can immediately uh, you know apply it in your games and when you get this structure i might i'm going to show you one more example of, after this so you know we'll hammer it home it's becoming a long video but but we're trying to learn chess here so f6 i built up here c5 more of, more of a build up. I think eventually I, I played knight f1 and knight g3 because that's a good square for the knight, so that's what I did. And this one was, was more complicated and, and maybe it's not really important. You know, slow moves and eventually you build up on the queen side. I think I want a pawn around here. No, I was going to win a pawn on b5, but he, he defended it. I got a uh, protected pass around d6 and I can put a knight on f5 when I want, so this is basically more or less completely winning. So we don't need to, you know, look at more. I won this game, uh, this was move 38. You know, it took some 20 moves, but I mean, white is completely winning. His pieces are horrible. We just have to find a way through. So the final example, you know, just to hammer, hammer it home. Uh, and this is between uh, Isidor uh, Gunsberg and Anthony Alfred Kest. So it's a funny name. I hadn't really thought about it too much. But we, we go into the middle game. And this was played in, you know, the 1800s. But Gunsberg played well here. And he posed white some, some difficulties. It's not the exact same thing. You know, black has a, has a space advantage. But he plays h4. 
And this is very important. Just like in the King's Indian, you play h4, and you make the decision difficult here. Because again, if I start to build up on the h file and I take on g3, this falls. In this case, the king is over here, so it's slightly different, but it's still the same. Eventually, white played g4, and we have the same thing. So, where do we build up? Where does black build up his position? On the queen side, of course. Knight e7, brought the knight, you know, brought the king over to, you know, to get the rooks. Build up, rooks coming over. Doubling the rooks, getting the knight to a better square. King f2, c4. Knight a4, you just build up, you have all the space in the world. And eventually, Gunsberg won a nice game. I think he even, yeah, he tripled. Alakan's gun. Good stuff. And then the C file is blacks. We can put something on C2. White went for desperation, but now we just run with the king over to the king side, and the checks run out, and it's going to be made. And this was all made possible because of the Averbach wedge. So I hope the lesson was useful. I call this the Averbach wedge from the Averbach, Averbach variation after Yuri Averbach. It was a very important pattern for me. It enabled me to win two important games, and one of them was uh, in a norm tournament. So I hope it will be good for you. And it's something you can apply if your opponent is playing, you know, some, uh, you know, slow, modern type setup. And uh, he can do that with both colors. So this is definitely something that, you know, can arise in your games and probably will. So, you know, take note and improve your chess. See you next time. Bye-bye.